Good evening and welcome to the Doolin Exchange Club membership meeting. My name is Lorelai Weimer and I am currently the president of the Exchange Club. I'm excited tonight because we have three speakers from the Doolin School Corporation and all three of them are counselors within the various schools. Tonight we have Karen Moffitt who has been with Doolin Schools for 25 years and is a counselor at Chesterton High School. We also have Laura Harrod. Laura is a counselor at Chesterton Middle School, and she has been with the Doolin School Corporation for 23 years. And Amy Snyder is a counselor in the elementary school of Bailey Elementary, and she has been with the Doolin School Corporation for five years. We're going to hear a lot about what they do on a day-to-day -day basis with their students. And we're also going to learn about how things have changed since uh, the pandemic and how that has impacted uh, the students and their interaction with the students. So please uh, join us tonight for this uh, important conversation. Schools for 25 years. What was fascinating for me to learn, Karen, is that you started out as a PE teacher and a health teacher before merging into uh, counseling and that you and your husband um, have lived in the Dooland area for 26 years. It seems like just yesterday you guys arrived so it's been, it's been a it's been a while and then most of us know um karen's husband is mont moffitt monty moffitt and they've been together for 33 years so so you've got a lot of uh experience and so karen we'll just go ahead and turn it over to you okay well thank you thank you for inviting us here tonight um i i enjoy this kind of thing so it, it's all good so laurel i talked about what a school counselor does and i think that is one of the, the biggest mysteries uh, in education sometimes is that a lot of people think that they know what their old guidance counselor um, from 25 years ago did, you know, just basically tell them, take this class, go to this college, and that was about it. Um, we've evolved quite a bit. Uh, we've evolved quite a bit since I first started in the field 25 years ago. Um, but I think one of the important things to remember is that we see your kids from all aspects. So we are looking at the kids from a social emotional viewpoint, from an academic viewpoint, and from a post-secondary or college and career type of viewpoint. So we're seeing every, every little piece of that. Um, and I think it's become over the past, since I've been doing this for 26 years, 25 in Duneland, um, I think that what I have noticed is the increase in social emotional issues with our kids. And probably in the last 10 years or so, we've seen in the high school grouping of kids, we've seen huge increases in anxiety and depression among our kids. And I can attribute some of that to social media where they're constantly comparing themselves to others who only post the happy things. And, the good things going on in their lives. So, um, but the pandemic only increased that anxiety and that depression. It left kids isolated uh, from their peers, from their friends. Um, they were isolated from us who, for a lot of them, their counselor is their go-to person in the building. We develop pretty close relationships with them. Um, they view the counseling office uh, as a safe place. I had a girl tell me that today. She goes, I got so upset and I just had to come here because I know this is my safe place. Um, so I think that during the pandemic, they lost or missed the fact that they could still reach out to us. Um, and maybe it was because they physically could not go to that that office or that space that they called their safe space, um, that they had to talk to us like I'm talking to you guys right now. And I will tell you that's been very hard for me as a counselor. It's tough to talk to somebody um, like this. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to make that connection when you're not always seeing faces. I will also say that during the, the pandemic, I've, I've talked to um, jumping babies. I've talked to uh, plates of asparagus. I've talked to football <laughs> helmets. Um, the kids often put their avatar up in, and then they don't turn their camera on. So if you've ever tried to counsel a plate of asparagus, um, it's pretty tough. So 
Um, so social emotionally, I think our kids have really struggled with the stress of the pandemic and then their normal stresses, their normal everyday stresses. Um, I think our kids um, on the academic side have struggled. We have seen some of our top students take nosedives academically. Um, they're not making connections with the teachers the way they normally would. Um, they're not, um, again, reaching out to their peers and having those, those connections that they have in the classroom. Uh, discussion, like I mentioned, discussion is hard in a class where half the class has their camera turned off and you're talking to avatars and half the class we're talking like this. So I think academically we've watched kids really struggle, which then plays into the social emotional side and increases their stress and anxiety. Um, and then the college and career side, wow, um, there have been so many changes and, and it's hard to keep up as a counselor with all the changes that have happened. Um, a lot of colleges, kids couldn't get in to take SAT and ACT tests. So a lot of colleges have gone what they call test optional and they, kids don't have to submit scores unless they are able to. Um, but I think that's left kids and families very confused. I think that um, some kids are fearful of spending a lot of money going off to college and living in a place for a year where all they're gonna do is online schooling. Um, so I, I think we've had more kids stay home, stay local and not spend the money on college. Um, I also think we've, we've had some things happen. I've noticed it this year with college admissions that some of the bigger schools and the really popular selective schools that kids wanna to try to get into have become even more selective. Um, they've had increases in applications. So that's produced, again, more stress for our kids. So, um, you know, I think a lot of the academic stuff and the college career, the trying to figure out what you want to do with your life in the middle of a pandemic, like, you know, a lot of us can't figure out what we're supposed to do from day to day, let alone figure out and make plans for what you're going to do for your whole life with this stuff going on. So I think kids are left um, very confused. And as counselors, um, at least at the high school level, we have struggled with reaching out to our kids. Um, at various times at the high school, we've had about 50% of our kids uh, remote. Some of those kids just ghost us completely. Um, we can't reach out to them. We can't make, get phone calls through to them. Um, they've disappeared. Uh, we, we, it's tough to help them make plans. And we are frustrated because we, you know, we've got that helping nature. We're all empaths and we all want to just um, really support our kids and reach out. But then when you can't make contact with the kid, it's, it's really a struggle for us. So that's, that's been especially hard. Um, I've got all kinds of stories about things that have happened during the pandemic and how kids have really struggled from uh, kids, for example, trying to run their computers off the hotspot on their phone. And you may think everybody has internet or everybody has Wi-Fi. No, they don't. Um, we've heard of kids going and sitting in the parking lot at McDonald's to pick up McDonald's Wi-Fi so that they can submit assignments. Um, we've had a lot of, at the high school side, we've had a lot of kids who've had to stay home to watch their younger siblings and help their younger siblings with school because parents have to work. And so that's been a challenge. Um, just just a, lot of, a, a lot of those types of things. Um, Laurel, I mentioned like what, what things would look like when it's normal. Um, I, don't, I don't see us becoming normal. Again, I think that the pandemic has led to some changes in the way maybe education is, is handled going forward. And some of, the, some of it positive and some of it negative, but I think some of the positive aspects of it is that we've learned we can educate students in this way and some kids do learn better this way. And so I think that we may see more opportunities for kids to take advantage of that. Um, 
I, I just know I'm, I'm one of those people who um, was real nervous about, about the pandemic and about getting COVID. And my office is not the same as it was. Um, I've got a comfy couch in my office and I've got stuffed animals and even high school kids like to pick up what I call the, the magic pineapple that has glitter, has the sequins on it that move up and down. Um, the comfort pineapple, so to speak. Um, and kids haven't had that opportunity and I think they miss out on that. It's, mm -hmm. it's tough also, not only talking to that plate of asparagus, but it's tough talking to a kid through a plexiglass screen. Um, and you don't feel like you can always make the connections that you wanna make. So I will, I will stop there. I could go on for a long time probably with different stories and different challenges that we faced. So. And what we're going to do, Karen, is we're going to have everybody hold their questions until all three of you okay. have had a chance to speak. Um, but wow, wow, I am just what I've learned just in these few minutes of just what you do, because I, you, we do think about when I went to school, which just so you know, is a long time ago, um, <laughs> where it was exactly what you said, is make sure you're in the classes and you need to know this is what you need to do before you're going to graduate. And that's what we, what I think of in terms of a counselor. And I knew that it's a lot more complicated um, these days. So for all of you as members, we are going to let everybody speak. And then we're going to do the uh, a question and answer for the panel. So again, great information. And now we're going to go ahead and move on to, so let me not have, there we go. Oops. I didn't mean to stop your camera. I accidentally stopped her camera. Sorry. Oh, I have to figure, I'll figure that one out. Yeah. Okay. Karen, if you can put your camera back on, I accidentally took your camera off. Sorry about that. And now we're going to go ahead to Laura. We're going to go ahead and. Okay. And Laura, so you are up. And uh, let's get. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. I was muted. Sorry. Um, as Laura likes said, I've been in Zoom in uh, 23 years. Um, I have my kids went through the Zoom in schools. Um, I have three of them that are all, they're all grown adults now. And um, I live here in Chesterton and I've been married for 37 years. So um, yeah, so being of that age, similar age as Karen and a, a few others, um, Counselors were looked upon as um, schedulers, um, pencil pushers. Um, and I think as I went through my, my um, counseling classes, um, what stood out to me was we have to constantly push against that misunderstood notion of what a counselor is. Um, I think counselors have been um, maybe the misunder most misunderstood staff member in the schools, um, mm -hmm. I would say. But it seems like the word counselor is used often, especially now. Um, and as Karen mentioned, um, social emotional um, concern for students have been on the rise, and um, we were very very becoming very mindful of. Um, meeting the social emotional needs of our students, but now with the pandemic, it's become so much more. Um, in the middle school, we see kids in their in-between stage. They're searching for they are searching for their identity, trying to figure out who they are, where they're going, and we try to help them with that along the way for sure. Um, and, and as I said, um, the social emotional issues you know, are part of that and they had been on the rise and now with the pandemic, um, the increase is just dramatic. Um, the pandemic has brought um, fear and worry to students and loneliness and isolation. I mean, it's done that to us adults. So to be um, a 12, 13, 14 year old, I can only imagine how it is and, and just, not knowing what the next day is going to bring and so on it's it's really really difficult and really uh, wow it's scary as an adult to watch the kids and um and see the the fear in their eyes and the worry and the concern and 
as Karen said, sometimes the kids are stuck at home helping to babysit because our kids are of age to babysit while their parents go off to work. And it's just, it's just really sad. So their academics are suffering and they're worrying about that. And, and we're, we're getting into a, like a vicious circle. Um, their anxiety is increasing. Then their academic success is going down. Um, and then it just keeps going round and round. Um, and so with the downward trend in academics comes more anxiety. And, you know, that's, that's, that's really hard. It's really hard for the students. Um, we too um, try to do the Zoom and Google Meets, um, even phone conversations. And for some reason I noticed with um, my kids, um, they're not super comfortable with the Google Meets or the Zoom meetings. I can just see it as they're sitting there. And they're much more comfortable in person, even though nowadays there is, I do have a plexiglass screen in front of me. Um, they sit farther away. We have more distance between us. We don't have soft things because that could be germy and, you know, all that has changed. Um, so, you know, I began to offer kids um, the opportunity just to talk on the phone so they don't have to be seen, but they can be listened to. And that seemed to go over just a little bit better. And um, so I would talk to them on my cell phone. Maybe not the best idea because they have your phone number, but I have not experienced any difficulty at all. And I just felt it was too important um, to reach out to these kids, especially our remote students. Um, you know, the kids that have been remote um, than, than not. Um, and, and you had asked Lorelai, what will it look like when we go back to normal times? And you know, as soon as you asked that, I was thinking, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I have no idea really what things will look like. Um, I don't know that they're gonna look like they did before. And if that's normal, I, I, you know, I don't know. Um, I think too that things may have changed permanently. And I know in business, they talk about the pandemic having brought permanent changes to the workplace and to the way people do business and so on. And I think maybe the way we conduct the business of education in school may be really different as we move forward. Um, I don't know, but the, the social emotional um, concerns of the students is just paramount. And, you know, in our building, we have a committee. Um, CMS has created a mindfulness room. Um, in, in there, we have like a self-care toolkit that contains information on breathing exercises and coping skills and things like that. Um, there's music and, and sounds, animal, um, live animal um, cameras. I think other buildings have done the same thing. Guided meditations and mindfulness, visual relaxation, all to help, particularly our students that have been remote and continue to be remote, but also our in-person students that need to um, maybe use this at, at home. Um, we brought activities um, into our SRTs. There, we have our students have two 15-minute SRTs a day, which is difficult for teachers to maybe tutor or help, but it's perfect for providing a little bit of social emotional learning. So we provide some activities, um, uh, things like, um, in a nutshell, it was an activity that we used and um, students answer just really brief questions with one or two words. Um, things like what makes someone a good friend, um, best teacher I ever had, um, a person I admire. So these are some things that get them to, to kind of think. Um, being thankful, writing a little paragraph or just talking, having conversations in SRT about being thankful. Like at Thanksgiving, we did, we did that exercise. Um, 10 by two activities where 10 times uh, for two minutes, a staff member reaches out to a student and just says, hey, how are you? How was your evening? What did you do? Um, and 10 times doing that for two minutes can create a relationship, can create a bond that that student might really benefit from. Um, so these are really important 
um, things that we need to, to continue and to grow with. Um, we also need to help our teachers become comfortable with doing these things because not everybody is super comfortable with it. And we also need to look at our staff because our staff members are struggling as well um, during these times. Um, you know, we do a lot of other things with our students, um, preparing them for their futures with regard to careers and um, planning for high school and college. Um, and, and I think the community knows a lot about those things that we already do. We do some body safety activities. We have someone come in um, to do a body safety presentation, um, but um, the social emotional um, learning and the social social emotional health of our students is is really critical, um, especially these days. And it had been before, but it's really about most concern right now. So, um, you know, especially with kids in middle school who are already struggling anyway. So. Um, and as Karen said, I could probably go on and on, but <laughs> I guess I'll I'll stop there and we can move forward and we can always answer some questions. So well, thank you, um, Laura, for giving us a, a good overview because it is, you know, middle school I think can be one of the harder ages because that of that transitional and trying to figure out who they are. And it's just that we all know we we're in that that age group and it's just a very unique time. And so you do have your own challenges, you know, with that with that age group. So again, thank you. Yes. I was just gonna say middle school reminds me a little bit of a tale of two cities. It's the best of times, it's the worst of times, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. can be really awesome, but it can be really the transition and everything is just, you know, it can be really very difficult. Harder for some than others, but it's just generally, you know, a tough time. So yeah. Well, great. Um, so thank you, Lauren. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming we're gonna have a lot of questions because I know I already have several questions myself. So <laughs> thank you guys. So now we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to um, Amy. And unlike what I did to Karen, I'm not gonna turn your video off and I'm gonna spotlight <laughs> Amy and then I will go ahead and... So Amy, if you wanna go ahead and give an introduction to yourself, I know that uh, you are with Bailey Elementary and I know you're one of the newer ones, been here for five years, but if you wanna give everybody a quick background on in who you are. Definitely, thanks for having us. Um, I think this is really a good conversation to be having outside of the school because we have these conversations a lot as school counselors, um, but we don't always get the opportunity to share that with the community. Um, so yeah, so I've been the school counselor at Bailey for five years, and um, I did my internship the year before that at Chesterton High School. Um, and five years ago when I was hired, Doolin Schools made the commitment to put a full-time school counselor in every elementary building, which, um, I think was great and um, much needed. And um, I, both of my colleagues have spoken about um, kind of the misunderstanding of what school counselors do. Probably some people didn't understand why would an elementary school even need a counselor, um, those sorts of things. And as Karen and Laura have been talking about um, like the social and emotional needs of students, we of course have that at the um, elementary level too, but not not just social and emotional because I think sometimes that um, it seems like um, the depth of the problems that we see maybe aren't quite encompassed with that term. Um, sometimes um, I explain to um, people I work with that um, sometimes a school counselor is the first or only mental health professional that a family or a student comes into contact with. Mm -hmm. So um, we see even at the elementary level true mental health concerns. Um, I also see um, behavioral concerns, family concerns, um, and then, you know, the social dynamics as kids, you know, learn how to do school and learn how to have friendships and all of those sorts of things too. Um, one of the really great things um, about having counselors in the elementary school is that um, I get to teach my students from a very young age how to advocate for themselves. And so um, that's something that is a recurring theme. I go into classrooms, I do lessons, um, I meet with students one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. And um, I mean, I just reiterate over and over again, like who is an adult you trust? If you have a problem, who can you talk to? Um, and what they learn through time is one of those people is me, <laughs> right? And so they can advocate for themselves by coming to talk to the counselor, but sometimes it's not me. Sometimes it's 
a teacher or um, you know, recess aide or their parents, right? But reinforcing that with them, that there are adults in their life that they can trust, that they can talk to if they have a problem. And so to see um, over the years that I've been there, more and more students coming to see me, you know, is really cool. Because um, when I first started at Bailey, kids weren't used to doing that. Um, they had a part-time counselor. She was split between two buildings. Um, they didn't get that opportunity to build a relationship with her. Um, and then having a full-time person in the building, um, the students started to realize like, oh, wait a minute, I'm having a problem. It's not an academic problem, but it's a problem I need help with. And um, you know, this person, maybe they can help me. So over the five years I've been at Bailey, um, I have definitely, I've seen the same that Laura um, and Karen have seen, which is increase in anxiety and depression, even with our youngest students. Um, the previous couple of years um, I saw, um, well, startling to me, um, increase in the number of students who were um, considering hurting themselves or were actually um, starting to take steps to hurt themselves. Um, and so that uh, led me, not this past fall, because of COVID restrictions, but the previous fall, um, we did a mental health uh, parent night um, and to help the parents understand the um, mental health needs of students. Um, and we hoped to repeat the event because it was very successful and, and then restrictions this year make it difficult. Um, but what, we, what I felt like from the um, attendance and the feedback that I got from that is the parents were like, wow, thank you for talking about this. Um, you know, our family is not alone or what I'm seeing in my kid, might, I might need additional help, those sorts of things. And it got some conversations started. So um, that's something I would love to see expanded in the future is helping um, families and our community understand um, the mental health needs of young students. I think sometimes the focus, and rightly so, I mean, high school and middle school get a lot of attention because Kids are preparing for their futures, they're getting ready to launch, they're becoming adults, all of those things. Puberty, right, gets a lot of attention. Um, but uh, the little ones, we start to see those things in the early years. And so um, I'm so grateful that Doolin has a full-time counselor in every single building. Um, so as far as this year, <laughs> so that's kind of, that's a broad, um, kind of overview of what I do at the elementary level. Um, I could give you stories for days, but um, this year, what we've seen, um, again, <laughs> the same as what Laura and Karen have been saying, um, that student stress levels, um, and not, not just that, but then what we see is um, families having to navigate, trying to I mean, people keep calling it homeschooling. It's not homeschooling, but essentially, right? They are uh, coordinating their students learning from home. And so the teachers are working double time, <laughs> trying to get everything ready for students and teaching in an environment that they've never taught in before. But the parents are also doing the same, right? They are caring for their families. They are um, maybe working multiple jobs. Um, they're trying to get their students' schoolwork done. And one of the things that we've noticed this year is the discrepancy between students who have families who are capable of um, supporting their child's education at home and student and parents who, for whatever reason, and a lot of times it's because they're working so hard to support their families and put food on the table, that they just don't have the time to invest um, in the sorts of things that would need to be done to support a normal school day, where the, the teachers are the ones who do that eight hours a day in normal school years, um, but so much of that has fallen back on the families. And um, we, <laughs> there's, we don't have good answers for that stuff. I mean, some of it came down to trying to get internet for people, um, trying to find alternate assignments. Um, but at some point I do think too, that the families kind of tapped out. Um, they, some families have hit walls with this and um, they're, uh, students uh, feel that pressure as well. And then also they don't have that every single day in-person supportive teacher, counselor, principal, school staff environment, right? That they're used to. And what we we're seeing is um, the importance of um, the school, the personal connection. Um, I do think some students can thrive in an online environment. I think some students are wired that way. I think that it works really well for them. 
but I think a lot of our families have been thrown into something that wasn't ideal and is going to be um, hard to come back from. I think we're going to, especially at the elementary level, um, I think we're going to be doing essentially like remediation for a couple of years and um, getting students caught up to where um, they're going to need to be when they go to like intermediate school and um, middle school and high school um, academically. Not any reflection at all on the efforts of the teachers. The teacher, I've never seen teachers work harder. Um, I've also never seen teachers uh, more stressed out. <laughs> all of my staff is completely stressed out. I've had more uh, staff members crying in my office this year than I've ever had. Um, I've had um, it's just, it's been so stressful on everybody. So um, we're seeing that on all the levels, right? With the, the staff, with the teachers, with the um, parents, with the kids, with, with everyone. Um, as far as the future goes, um, I wish we could say, right, um, that things are gonna go back to normal. I do think, so I thought as, as uh, Karen and um, Laura were talking about this, I thought, well, what are some positive things maybe um, that might change. Um, and one of those things is, um, I mean, we have young kids rocking the technology stuff. So some are still struggling, right? Or maybe their internet is inconsistent or they're tethering off their parents, you know, 4G and their parents hit a data limit and they literally stop submitting assignments because they've run out of data for the month. Um, but um, in general, I would say kids are really um, getting very comfortable with technology. So uh, there's pros and cons to that. We don't want them on the screens too much, but can they, um, you know, scan an assignment and submit it as a PDF? Like, yeah, first graders can do that stuff. Like, it's pretty cool. Um, I've had um, the opportunity to do counseling um, on Zoom with students. And one of the coolest things this year for me was at the beginning of the year, um, I set up a Google form and I sent it, I, I consistently send it out to my students and remind them like, hey, this is here. And um, they can check in with me. So they don't have to necessarily see me face to face, but it gives them an opportunity to fill out a little form. And it tells like kind of a check in, like, how are you feeling? I have had over 800 responses on that. So um, the students are wanting that connection. And then one of the questions on it is, do you want to meet with Mrs. Snyder on Zoom? And uh, sometimes they'll say yes. And so that's another way for them to advocate for themselves. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work. So it's hard to get a kid, um, a young kid <laughs> and older kid to show up at the right time. But I have may have been able to make it happen. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, another positive thing is that we've um, brought parents into the building via Zoom. And so um, maybe they work full time or multiple jobs or they have, you know, I mean, we have some families who have children with special needs at home and so it's hard for them to leave the house or whatever and um, to be able to do um, a parent meeting or an IEP or a 504 via Zoom has been really I think beneficial in a lot of ways. We miss some of that human interaction but sometimes when we kind of just have to get the business done right and then it's it's less inconvenient for the family um, to be able to do it um, on Zoom. So that's kind of the update from the elementary world, um, as far as that goes. What I'm going to do, Amy, is I'm going to get, um, if I do this correctly, you guys are much better pros at this. I'm going to add a spotlight to Karen, and then I'm going to add a spotlight to Laura. So what we're going to do is we're going to open it up to questions. So one of the questions that I had, and I'm going to open it up to everybody else, um, but so Amy, when a child is transitioning from Bailey onto the intermediate school, then onto the middle school, then onto uh, high school, do you guys pass that person on? So like, so for example, I know we don't have somebody from the intermediate school, but would you, if you knew your child was going to go to a specific counselor, do you give them the heads up that here's what I've been working on with them? So are you guys all in communications with each other? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I'm sure you guys do this too. Um, I meet with Maureen every year and um, I share with her the information of um, the students who need maybe um, a little extra attention or have had um, some traumatic stuff happen um, so that they can follow through with the um, kind of continuity of care there. Okay. And then Laura, you were saying the same thing. So you'd be handing off to Karen and, and the high school staff. Yeah, we try to give um, Karen the information to pass on to her um, 
for colleagues um, about students that, you know, they just might want to kind of keep an eye on and check up, you know, check up on, um, you know, and a lot of times peers, they find the high school people find that that student that we were so concerned about is a little concern there because maturity really kicks, begins to kick in mm -hmm. and things um, are so much better, but we still want to give them a little a little heads up about students that we have concerns for. And also we meet with um, the two counselors from the intermediate schools and they pass on um, information to us in regard to, you know, students that have different kind of plans or students that, you know, just need to be kind of watched over or, or whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. All right, well, I'm going to open it up to Exchange Club members. Remember you're on mute. So if you want to say anything, just make sure you unmute. And then, uh, and then also let, if you have a question specifically for one of the counselors to let them know uh, who you're addressing the question to, or if you want all three to, to answer the question. So let's go ahead and open it up to uh, other folks to ask questions before I ask all my other questions. I have a question. Yes. This one is for Laura. Um, recently, uh, we, were, we had Dr. Pettit here at one of our meetings and he talked about the Capitals Improvement Plan. And I couldn't be more excited about everything that's going to be happening because it's necessary. Now that we have this window of opportunity of finance finances, we can really make some major changes. But being a person in the community and fairly well known, I get asked a lot of questions about this kind of stuff. And every person has expressed the same concern. The middle school, why are they going to put fifth and sixth grade together and seventh and eighth grade together? And I tell them it's going to be separate wings but do you have any words of wisdom that I could specifically share with these, these people in the community? And these are people that don't even have children. I think mm -hmm. a lot of them are just wanting to find fault with a program mm -hmm. and they call me and say, what do you think about it? That can't be a good idea. If you have any words of wisdom for me to impart on these people, I would appreciate it. <laughs> well, first thing I would say is change is hard, you know, and this is a big change. Um, we know that many districts um, have students that are six through eight or five through eight together. Okay. Um, I believe the plan is to kind of have two mini schools within the school. I think there's going to be a principal for fifth and sixth grade. There's going to be a principal for seventh and eighth grade. So they're going to kind of... Um, be under you know the same roof, but they're going to kind of revolve in separate pods or separate areas of the school. Um, so I think they're really thinking this through carefully um, to make sure they're meeting the needs and and you know worries and concerns um, of the differences in development um, of these students. So I, they're not taking this lightly, that's for sure. And I do think that they're going to have you know, like I said, a principal for seventh and eighth and a principal for fifth and sixth. And the two um, age groups, you might want to say seventh and eighth and fifth, are going to kind of be in their own little realm, their own little world. So I think it's going to be absolutely okay. Yeah. Well, that's good. I also think that it's going to be a, a lot more opportunity. I mean, I just think of sports and actually being a former coach, that there'll be more opportunities for kids to play. Now, oh. something that happened I'm on the old end. When I remember when Liberty and Westchester were two separate and when yeah, the uh, freshmen came yeah. together to play basketball, some of those ninth grade boys wouldn't pass the ball if they were from Liberty mm -hmm. or if they were from Westchester. And that, and we took us a while to overcome that. So yeah. let's not, let's think of some of those things too, as we join these together, we want to still wear maroon and gold I think that everybody should wear the same colors. Um, there were some issues and it took several years to brand, to bridge that gap. Right. So I, I hope that they think about that um, just because I was on the other end of that. Um, mm -hmm. When I first came to Doolin, uh, when, we, when the schools you know, came together and were consolidated, that there was some problems there. Wait, so I think Liberty wore blue and white, correct? Correct, mm -hmm. they were the Liberty yeah. Lions. They weren't even the yeah. Chester Trojans. Right. So, I, you know, right there and then you have a um, situation. Yeah. So anyway, um, I just, I've been getting a lot of feedback and pushback from the community. People right. that don't really want to, they think it's going to cost them money. So they want to find fault. And yeah. they're asking me all these questions. But thanks for your tips because 
I'm yeah. trying to be as intelligent, giving them the most intelligent answers that I can. Thoughtful and, answers. And I say, why not be positive? Why look to the negative always? No. Why mm-hmm. go that direction? Why not think about it as a positive thing and have faith in the people that are handling this, that they're going to do the right thing? That's what I, I would say that. My first reaction to these people that are, want, to be, want to go negative is, why? Why are you going? You have no reason. You know, let's. Oh. I like your words. I'm going to use have faith, have faith in the super, have faith in the, because we right. have wonderful staff. Right. Exactly. Wonderful exactly. staff at our school corporation from exactly. the top all the way down. So right. They're not out to harm the students. So they're not out to wreck the community. It's all about doing Growth. better for everybody. Growth. So yeah, I, I, I really shudder when I hear people go that negative route. It's okay. Method. I appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions from the members? It's a pretty quiet bunch today. Oh, Jackie. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for giving in your time tonight. Really appreciate it. It's been very informative. And I really don't have a question. I just wanted to commend you for your, you can hear it in your voices, your empathy mm-hmm. and your sincerity and the commitment to the kids. So, you know, we're lucky to have you here and with our kids. So thanks for Thanks for doing what you do. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Jackie. You guys are such great supporters of us, you know, and, and of school and education. We appreciate that. Great. Thank you. Uh, other members? And just remember if you're on <laughs> just remember if you're on mute to unmute. I can't find my hand to raise, you know. I where's that little thing where you raise your hand? <laughs> I can't find it. Well, you're speaking, so we can hear you, Pam. So go ahead and ask your question. <laughs> well, that's what I did. I just unmuted because I'm like, well, if I can't raise my hand, I'll do the kiss and just go, hey, 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 I have a, I have a question and a comment. Um, mostly it's a comment working at Bailey School. And I think Maria will agree with me here. Um, I would find it really hard to believe that, uh, um, to imagine, I should say, not having a counselor at Bailey School or any of the other elementary schools all of the time, because I see what Amy does. She is a busy, busy lady. And um, I just appreciate how much she does. I've seen her, uh, she stepped in when I did recess duty and things like that. And a child would have a problem, Amy would be there in a second. Um, classroom, um, and like she said before too, just with the staff, she, if I meet her in the hall and I'm sure Laura and uh, Karen are the same way, she uh, checks with me too. How are you doing, you know, is everything good? And it's so wonderful to have you ladies and, um, there to support our kids and our staff and really do as a staff member appreciate it even more because I really really see how much you guys help but I did have one question too um one of the arguments that's been used during the pandemic to get uh corporations to open to get kids back into school is they say that all of these kids at home things like um abuse and um neglect and stuff has been on the rise as well as other family problems um is that also something you guys have seen um as counselors that um, everybody is under so much pressure, the parents and, you know, that, um, the number of kids having family issues have even gone up because of it. I would, I would say, Pam, at the high school level, um, I don't really think we've had an increase in the number of reports that we've made on students. I think the manner or the, you know, the reason for the report often has been different, um, where we will have a student have excessive absences, just like I, like I mentioned before, ghosting us completely. Um, and we'll call the parent and the parent says, 
oh, we've got the kid, the kid's sitting right here on the computer, I watch them every day, but yet we've got records that the student is not checking in. And so I think some of our reports have, have flipped from the physical side of things to more educational neglect type of things. Um, okay. So. That's and, um, interesting. At Bailey, our um, kind of average number of reports to Department of Children and Family Services has gone down this year. Um, I think there's a few reasons for that. And I, I do think that there are, I think there's reasons to consider what you're saying, which I know has been an argument nationwide to open schools. And um, if you flip that on, if you flip it over, what it shows is how valuable schools are to the community, right? And right. so people are maybe finally recognizing like, oh, schools actually do a lot more than just educate your kid. So, um, we, uh, you know what's going to happen now, as soon as I say Bailey's numbers are down, I'm going to be reporting five <laughs> weeks, but um, I think that a few, re like Karen is saying, we've had students that we've had to follow up with for educational neglect, um, but I think that that face-to-face uh, -face interaction where the students trust us and they get to a point where they disclose to a staff member what's happening at home, um, I do think that there's been a barrier this year, as there has been with all of us with all of our relationships. Um, the other uh, part of that is we do have some students who've been learning from home all year. Um, and when they are at home and I'm talking to them on Zoom, they aren't in a private space. So it's very different. We can't guarantee privacy for that student. And um, when I would do a Zoom with a kid, um, I would say, are you somewhere where you feel like you can talk? And I, I had elementary students say, no, hold on a second and they would leave their kitchen table and go to their bedroom and close the door. Um, I had other ones who said, oh yeah, I'm fine. And they just want to sit at the kitchen table and their brothers and sisters are running around and it was fine for them. But um, I think that those things are some of the reasons why maybe Bailey's reporting numbers are down this year. Um, I mean, I would love to, to think like, oh, that just means child abuse is down, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think what we might see in the next couple of years is some of those stories start to come out. So as the kids reconnect um, with the, the teachers and the educators and all those people that are important to them, um, I think we might start to hear some unfortunate stories. Amy, I had a question for you. Um, you know, putting the pandemic aside, you were talking about uh, kids in, in elementary school having more of that anxiety and stress that you're seeing. And, and thankfully that's why you guys have full-time counselors there. What is causing that anxiety at such a young age that, you know, what are the, the causes of that? Man, if I knew I would be very rich, I think, but I, I can speculate, right? And I do, um, I read a lot on this topic because I'm very interested in this and that's my chosen field. And so um, I think that uh, some of it is family stress, right? They just um, absorb what's happening in their families. Um, some of it is, um, even before we got to pandemic stage of technology use, um, we have over the past 10 or 12 years become more and more reliant on technology. And so um, I think that families are not as connected with each other anymore, as well as um, students are not, um, <laughs> I'm going out on a limb here. They're not necessarily learning some of the social skills and coping mechanisms because families are less connected. Um, and I'm not trying to judge families. Families have all sorts of stresses coming at them from all angles. And I think that um, the idea of an iPad as a babysitter has become a very common thing. Um, and it works for some situations. Um, but the reason I say that specifically is because um, like for two examples, one is um, we have a greater number of students every single year and Maria will attest to this, who come to kindergarten and who've never held a pencil. And so um, we get, we're seeing more of those. And so that's one indication to me that they're spending a lot of time on technology. Um, another is that I, um, every year I've been at Bailey, um, we have had students who um, have clearly not been taught any sort of like self-regulation techniques. And then, so a very key component to self-regulation is when you're young is co-regulation. So the adult that is in your life are they helping you regulate your emotions? 
And so we have students show up at Bailey who um, I know, <laughs> I can tell, I don't need to meet the family. I, I know that they um, don't know how to regulate themselves, most likely because they don't have that type of attachment with their family. Now, I don't know why the attachment is missing or the co-regulation piece was missing. Um, and lots of things could play into that. They have nothing to do with te technology, including their own um, maybe um, undiagnosed mental illness in the family or um, just the stresses of daily life or somebody working three or four jobs. I mean, there's lots of reasons why that happens. Um, but yeah, I think that um, what we see is some of that. Um, we see the family stress and it trickles into the students. And um, we have kids come and tell us they're worried about their families, <laughs> you know? I mean, um, yeah, I've had kids tell me they're worried their families are gonna get deported. I mean, why are elementary kids talking about this? Mm -hmm. But it's a real mm -hmm. conversation I have in my office. Well, thank you, Amy. That was very helpful because you just are trying to figure out what's what's the cause of this. The next question is for all three of you. Um, what do you guys do? I'm assuming if there's a point where you guys can take the counseling so far, and then do you also, will you recommend that they get outside help in addition to what you guys are providing? So let's go ahead and start with Karen, then Laura, and then Amy. Well, I think one of the things that has become very common in school counseling right now is uh, what you might call a tiered level of support. So at the very base of it, picture a food, you know, the triangle, at the very base, you've got programming that you do for all of your students at, at the building. Every single kid gets that type of programming. Um, and then you move up to the middle and you have about 20% of your kids where the, the programming becomes more intensive, um, remedial in nature. So you think about the kid who may not be progressing academically the way they should. So you're hitting uh, special programming and special types of activities for those kids. When it comes to social emotional, it might be that student is in a small group um, discussing a particular topic. And then at the very tip top at the point, you have a smaller number of students. And so those students are tend to be the ones academically who might get referred for special education testing, who um, on the social emotional side of things, they, they might be, you know, you might bring the parent in and discuss the opportunities for counseling um, that, are, that are available locally. So that's pretty much how we approach it at the high school. Laura? Yeah, similar in the middle school. Um, we do large group classroom kinds of things that reaches all students. Um, and then as Karen mentioned, we do the same thing with smaller groups. Um, with um, so it grows in intensity because then it's it's just a, you know a smaller group of kids that we're working with and then finally um, at the top is just that real very small handful of kids that um, you work with and then you refer them um, to outside um, to outside agency outside counselor as you see fit and we definitely do that um, um, as school counselors for sure because we're not training to handle all the things that some students may need. Um, so, yeah. And, and just to get back to the, um, the uh, question or comment or whatever it was um, in regard to um, um, the, like the, the stress and, um, and, and I know middle school students, you know, really retreat from their parents and they're into technology and they're on their, their iPads and their devices so much and so much of that contributes to their self-esteem and how they feel about themselves. And, you know, it just creates, um, you know, a lot of stress and anxiety as well, but being home so much, they want to kind of retreat from parents or what's going on with the family due to, you know, money worries or things like that right now. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that comment. There was one more comment I was going to make, but well, oh, I'll move on. <laughs> I know it's getting late. So, <laughs> Amy, did you want to add anything regarding the last question? Uh, yeah, just real quick. Um, for the past, for the previous couple of years, 
the school counselors have been advocating trying to get mental health agencies to be able to come into our schools. Mm -hmm. um, and Doolin Schools entered into a partnership with Crown Counseling this year. And um, I think they have about 40 or 45 students, Doolin students on their caseload. So one really cool thing about that is that um, it removes the barrier of transportation um, from the family. So the um, counselor comes in every week or every other week. So um, I mean, I would say close to 100% of the time, if a student's been referred for that, it's been by us, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, we've been working with a student and um, you know, we've seen that their needs are progressing beyond kind of the triage that we can um, provide at school. And we've been able to ref um, offer them like, hey, we actually have this service in our building and um, it's been received really well. So I look forward to that type of partnership expanding in the future. Um, and I think the reason we have that is because school counselors spoke up and we said, um, you know what, we need more. We're seeing more of these mental health needs um, and we see some of our families who need the help the most um, have some barriers of accessing mental health services. And so how can we make that work? And then we're lucky to have um, a current administration that uh, decided that that was a priority. Yeah, that's great. I did not know about that. Here's the last question that I have. Um, what could we do from the Doolin Exchange Club? I know we have sponsors, per, we have sponsored programs that Doonbrook does, but are there any things that maybe you can't get because of budget that we could be providing for you guys that I know, you know, and I know that there's probably a lot of things, but anything that you think that we as, as the Exchange Club could be doing to help you guys do your jobs better or what that looks like? And, and again, we'll go from Karen to Laura and then to Amy. Well, um, wow, where do I, where do I start? Um, I know at the high school, um, one of the things that we try to do is, is do some fun activities with the kids to kind of just um, reduce tension. So I'll, I'll just throw out one example. In May, well, it'll be April 30th, but May 1 is known as National Decision Day where high school students need to make their college decisions. Um, some people call it college signing day. We're gonna call it decision day because we want kids to come forward and talk about all their decisions, whether it's the decision to go to the military or to a trade, uh, to an apprenticeship program, whatever they might be deciding to do. And so we're really trying to celebrate that. And it's, it's those types of events that we often don't have funds or we don't have materials that we can um, we can use to kind of celebrate with the kids so so things like that are always welcome mm, that is great because it's something that we could get a budget for and to know and the community likes to know that they're supporting something specific right so to say that we want to help uh, the high school with uh, the big celebration for decision day. So, so Karen, if you could put something together of what that looks like and what some of the needs are. So if it's for food and beverage, or you said some materials, if you could just put that together and get that sent to me and Jackie, that would be helpful. I, I will do that. Thank you. Cause those, I know those things, those things seem little, but it's a big deal for you guys. And we certainly wouldn't want you to have a less of a celebration because you didn't have the funding for it. Thank you. I appreciate That's great. that. So Laura, what's on your wish list? Well, a couple of things popped in, in mind. Um, one thing, and it's kind of specific, but um, we work with our English language learners, and um, it, it, it seems that you know we are really short on resources, and um, and and I guess there's a money issue in regard to getting some of these resources to help teachers in working with. And, and us in working with our students that are coming in um, as English language learners. And so that was something that popped in my mind immediately. But also, we um, try to, um, as a committee, we try to um, uh, get the people to mentor students. And then through the mentoring, we want to honor their successes. And it's kind of a celebratory thing as well. And we really haven't done uh, much of that this year well, due to the kind of year it's been, but it also um, involves some funds. And um, so, you know, it'd be nice to be able to celebrate with them a little bit more elaborately, but, you know, a nice 
compliment or pat on the back is, is good too. You know, just mm -hmm. the acknowledgement of a student going from a, you know, a, a D to, you know, raising their grades to these, in, you know, A's, B's, C's, mm -hmm. you know, that's really special. It needs to be noted. Mm -hmm. And as a, a committee, um, we are trying to push that with our teachers to acknowledge the students that are making these, um, these strides. And we talked about celebrating and maybe having a little, you know, celebration party before school or after school, but um, it just hasn't been so easy um, at this point. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, one more thing I was going to mention on that other note, Pam had mentioned, you know, child abuse. And I know that on the news, there had been talk about child abuse increasing um, in homes. And as Karen said, I think it's been for us to the education of neglect, kids that just were falling through the cracks and kids were not engaging at all remote learners. And um, that's, you know, that's been really difficult. So that's been a, a different kind of abuse, I, I would say. Um, so I don't know that there's been an increase. And as Amy mentioned, I think it's true. We probably will see more of these come out in the open as time goes on, because in a sense, the kids have been kind of muzzled um, right now. And so I think we, you know, we may very well see more of that. So anyway, I'll shut up now. <laughs> well, so same to you. And it's going to be the same thing to Amy. Um, Laura, please go ahead and put together a little write up of, of what, like when you're looking at the English, English language learners information and what that looks like and what the cost would be as well as what you're looking at in terms of what you would need to, to honor those that have had some successes. Um, so just again, and get that email to me and then I will make sure I get that off to the board um, just so that we have an idea of what we're looking at and things that we can really help you guys with. So Amy, I'm sure you have a wish list as well. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Um, one thing um, that you guys can do for us that doesn't cost any money is just um, to continue to advocate among the people that you know for public schools and the work that um, educators in general do and school counselors. Um, as you get the opportunity to share with um, friends, you guys are all influential in our community. And um, as, as you know, <laughs> we need community support. Um, and so uh, I really appreciate you taking the time tonight to listen to us jabber. Um, something I've wanted to do for years and just haven't had the budget to do is to create like a little calm down corner for the um, classrooms. And so um, that would, you know, I'm picturing like um, little sand timers and fidget toys and things that kids, if they just need a break in the classroom, um, every year I get a small budget and um, I spend some of my money on that, but I keep it in my office and then kind of give it out on an as needed basis or whatever. And then um, everybody in my building knows if they ever go to a conference to pick up all the stress balls, right? They all, mm -hmm. they all live in my office, but um, there's, there's tools that are um, kind of better for kids um, to fidget with than a stress ball. And um, kids sometimes just need, especially the little ones, they just need time to kind of chill for a minute and then they can rejoin their class. And so um, I've always kind of thought, well, what would that look like? But with, um, you know, 20 classrooms plus three special ed classrooms, um, then uh, it gets to be expensive. So, um, so that's just been a dream of mine. So Amy, again, put that on paper and you have my email. So please email that okay. to me and we will definitely look at it. And what I will do is um, I don't want to think, I don't want Liz and Wiz, right? The the counselors that are not here tonight to go, oh my gosh, we missed out on our wish list. I'm, I'm going to reach out to them as well and just ask them, you know, for their school specifically, you know, what we could do for them. And then of course we have the other, other, other elementary uh, counselors as well. So Karen, do you, are you the keeper of all the counselors in terms of, because I don't have no, okay. I can, I can get you names. Okay. I'd be happy to get you names. If you give me names, because I, I don't, I definitely want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to just let us know what that one or two wish list item is. And then once we get it, we can kind of look at what we can do. And, and that doesn't mean we don't do specific um, fundraisers specifically for your guys's needs, because, you know, to echo what Pam and, and uh, Jackie said, seriously, the work that you guys are doing, I just don't think people understand that you guys are the, the critical component uh, in terms of, you know, helping kids out. And I just, I can't thank you guys enough for everything you guys are doing. So, you know, I know that if we can help you with some of these wish list items that you don't have budget for, I know we would be happy to, to see what we can do to help you guys. Thanks, I appreciate thank that. Thank you. Very thank generous. You. So before we leave, I'm gonna ask if there's any other questions 
um, from our uh, club members. And then also if there's anything else that any of you want to, uh, as our special guest tonight, have to say as well. So final questions from members. I, okay. I do want to make yes, a real quick point. Teaching prior to having a full-time counselor in the elementary school versus teaching with a full-time counselor in, in, at Bailey, night and day. Mm -hmm. Especially, I mean, kindergarten doesn't, you know, you wouldn't think that that would be a complicated grade with social emotional growth but it is probably the most difficult. Mm -hmm. And funny story, Mike Grubb, the first day he was the principal, he came to me after school and said, I thought kindergarten would be the easy grade. He said, kindergarten is the hardest grade. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, well, I appreciate you realizing that and I appreciate your support. So Amy and all the elementary counselors, when we finally got a full-time counselor at each elementary school, it was so needed mm -hmm. and so appreciated. And like Pam had said, I mean, I, I, I was on, for most of my career, we had a part-time counselor that would come once in a while. Mm -hmm. And the difference having a full-time person in the building is paramount. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. And then uh, Karen and Laura and Amy, any other final thoughts before we, we say good night? Great. Thank you, well, thank thank you, you for all. listening to us. No, it was really seriously. I learned a lot, and I think we all learned a lot. And I think we're going to be able to to help you with some with some of the things that you're looking to get. And so, thank you guys again. I hope we see you on April 29th. And uh, so we look forward. To, we always look forward to that event, and I'm excited that we get to do it again this year since we didn't get to do it last year. So, see you April 29th. And again, thank you guys for participating. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Good night. Bye. -bye. Bye.